So now we will move to the to the discussion. So Francesco, we will add two more panelists to our discussion, right? So yes. of course we'll invite our four speakers uh, to be to be uh, on hold here, and we'll ask also Sajata Govad, the founder and director at UDP International in Hong Kong, to join us, and Isabella Rossen, urban sociologist and associate at Urban Transcript Qatar, to to join us uh, for the panel. Thank and, you, Nuno. So, are we all are we all ready? So now we'll have our our discussion. Of course, I have several questions for our uh, for our speakers. Um, I would also like to open the floor for questions. So, if you have any question, I think that the best way is to write the questions on the chat. I I think that this worked well in the morning session. I wasn't able to see it on the afternoon session. So, if you have questions, please write them on the chat, and then I will I will ask the questions to the speakers. Uh, and we also have our two uh, panelists. Uh, so I would like to give the floor to Sajata to start to kickstart uh, the discussion after such an inspiring present for presentations. I think this is uh, thank you, Nuno. This has been an amazing session. Uh, all the speakers, uh, I think, have done a brilliant job. I I mean, really uh, like the start with Matthew talking about public uh, publicization, or I think of private space, which is quite different from in Hong Kong, what we hear all the time is privatization of public space. And so to open our minds to this phenomena uh, is, and I think also he stressed about uh, what is more important is how public or the publicness of the uh, spaces is more important, whether it is uh, privately or publicly owned. And I, it made me remember about Hong Kong situation, especially if you have uh, LCSD maintained parks or public spaces in Hong Kong, you always have this big list which says no skating, no biking, no whatever, 100 things. And I remember when we first came to Hong Kong, we never saw that board. We went in and enjoyed with roller skates, kids biking, everything came out and then saw the board on the way back. And that's how, uh, uh, even though it is publicly, uh, uh, it's supposed to be public space, there are many restrictions in Hong Kong. So I think this was very uh, well put together. I enjoyed uh, Matthew's presentation. And I think Sienna, the city at height level, I think it's amazing, a great initiative. And it's also, I think more important because of its collective examples taking from not only in Asia, but other places, and it can grow into something even bigger as we grow. And I always believe that cities need to share and cities actually need to learn from each other. And this would be a great way of doing it. And with the Pablo's, I think, uh, disrupting public space or even designing, questioning about designing disorder, I think that's also a, a big wake up call. I liked the fact about what he uh, mentioned about uh, not just scaling up, but actually uh, uh, creating networks and municipalism and also the infrastructures for disorder. In other words, creating or facilitating for disorder to be designed actually in a way. Uh, uh, so that it doesn't uh, get into, so that was really good. And I think the last presentation uh, with Meher, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your yes. name uh, right, but I think it was actually put everything together quite well uh, with uh, your theoretical framework on formal and informal, uh, but uh, then stumbling into the other uh, categories of, uh, you know, adding nature and culture. I, I thought when you said uh, DI, uh, DIY, maybe one thing you could also add is co-creation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Where, uh, uh, because, you know, that is something that we are doing. Um, and uh, with the uh, biomimicry, I think biophilic design, I guess, as you've already mentioned. Uh, so I think this wraps it up quite well, as you mentioned in, mm -hmm. for the whole panel. 
So I think it will be very uh, interesting to see how we can take this forward into towards the end of the conference. And I can see a lot. I've watched all the three sessions today and I can already tell it's going to be a very good uh, closing session by the end of tomorrow. So very well done. Thank you very much. And these are my, you know, uh, reflections on the uh, speakers and the presentations. Thank you, Sujata. Thank you. That's, uh, such a clear overview of our four presentations. Isabella, now it's your turn. Thank you very much. This was indeed a very inspiring and thought-provoking uh, series of presentations and raised for me also a lot of questions about um, how these, these thoughts and ideas can be applied indeed in the context of Hong Kong, which is quite different. And so I mostly actually have more questions relating to this. And I was thinking about um, uh, the kind of how do you sustain and or, or um, allow for these ideas of uh, anarchic spaces and informal spaces in, in the kind of rapidly developing urban context of Hong Kong. And I think it would be amazing to, to give that some more thought as, for example, um, I know a bit a neighborhood uh, in Hong Kong that's, that was had actually a rich diversity of informal or more informal spaces, but then was connected to the uh, main net metro network and underwent this kind of rapid commercial development, um, which unfortunately erased quite some of the more undetermined public spaces. Um, so I would, I think it would be really interesting to see how some of these concepts and ideas um, can, can apply in, in this kind of context. And I would love to hear the panelists reflect on, on that. And also, I, I completely agree with uh, what Shijata said about the science. It's, it's also an interesting uh, thought that um, it doesn't, I, I was quite inspired by this charter uh, Professor Carmona talked about, but I was also thinking it matters very much how you present this, because even, even the design of a communication such as a charter of rights matters in the way people perceive their um, kind of yeah freedom in, in, in using a space. Um, these were some of my first uh, thoughts and reflections. And thank you very much. Thank you, Isabella. So I think that maybe I will also, uh, I'll be very opportunistic on this, on this presentation because we need to take good ideas that we can, uh, that we can take and implement on the Greater Bay from your presentations. So maybe I will take on Isabella's uh, question and I will ask a first question to Matthew. Uh, Matthew, you were talking about the charter and you were saying that uh, uh, when we go to public spaces in Macau, in Hong Kong, mostly in Hong Kong, we have that sign that is saying that it's forbidden to do 20 things. So it's uh, in Macau, we have no sign, so there's no, uh, Basically, it's, it's very different. In Hong Kong, you have, you cannot do this, you cannot do 20 things. Uh, in Macau, you, you don't have many public spaces and they are not that managed. So I, I think that is quite interesting, the approach of the charter as an encouragement to use. Because in some places, people don't really know what they can do on the public space. So my question to you would be, how can we uh, use the charter and this kind of mindset to, to improve the, the usage of public space in this, in this kind of places in the Greater Bay that we have very different conditions. We have Hong Kong, we have Macau, and then we have uh, the Chinese cities that, that have very different conditions from, from these two places, from Hong Kong and from Macau. Thank you. I, I think Isabella was absolutely right. that it, It's not just about putting a tool in place like a charter. It's about how you do it and, and who's involved with that. And, um, you know, the situation in the Greater Bay, it may be that, you know, in some places, Macau perhaps, a charter's not required. You know, if, 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 if there is, you know, I've not been to Macau for many, many years, but, but uh, you know, if, 
if there is broad freedom and people are, are, are able to do as, as they will and there's not a, not, not a problem, then I don't think it necessarily you need to put a charter in place. But somewhere like Hong Kong, perhaps you do, because I think there's a tendency for local authorities, but also private developers to try and control things and try and control things often too much. Um, and it was a fascinating exercise. I talked about this this, this Nine Elms charter that I was uh, working on with the, these developers. And, and that was a fascinating exercise to go through with them because they started off wanting to control all sorts of things. And I was saying, you know, no, it's not about control. It's about encouraging. It's about encouraging behaviors. And if you start from that perspective, you say, right, what do we want to encourage in this space? Then actually you find there's a very short list of things which you really, really don't want to happen in the space. Like, for example, lighting fires. Um, now that was one thing which it does. There is something in the charter about barbecues, for example. <laughs> um, and but that was one of the very few things that ultimately we, we came down to say that, that there, there was this very small list of things which you can't do. Uh, another one was driving in the in in the park, you know, and everything else is encouraged. And I think that's the way to approach it. Um, and you, the way to do that is to engage people, developers, the public sector. If there's a community, then then a community as well in actually putting together such a charter. Thank you. But we already have a problem. We need to fire stuff in Macau. We need firecrackers is a tradition that we have. So your charter needs to incorporate this possibility because this is something that we really need in Macau. Oh, yeah. No, no. It's nothing about... We have lots of fireworks here as well. So <laughs> it doesn't say anything about fireworks. Yeah, <laughs> so I think that this idea of encouraging... So if we're talking about Macau, uh, if you say that you cannot do this, you cannot do that, of course, you want to do that. So you cannot fly a kite in a public park in Hong Kong. Of course, I want to fly a kite. Last time I was flying a kite, I was five years old, but now I want to fly a kite. Uh, so if they say that you cannot, suddenly you want. But I think that in Macau, the situation is a bit the other one, is that you don't know what, how many things you can do. So if you can encourage different possibilities of usage of public space, I think that that is inspiring. So that empowers people to be able to use the public space, not just like a residual space, but like a space that belongs to them for a moment, for, for a period of time. So I think that this idea of moving from restrictions to encouragements is something that is quite inspiring in your presentation. Thank you. So maybe now I will move with another question to, to Sienna. Sienna, uh, you were talking about all these cities in, in Asia. Uh, of course, you have a, a very comprehensive book. So what can we, uh, the takeaway, so what are we, in terms of Asia, what is really special that is happening in the urban uh, fields in Asia? So what can Asia uh, teach, so to speak, to the other places like Europe or the States that is not happening over there? Many well, times I think talk about okay. Asia learning from other places. Now, what can other places learn from Asia since you now have all this wealth of, of, of knowledge about Asia? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's very interesting to see um, that lots of different places in Asia, um, people are natural born placemakers. It's very um, easy for them to, to sort of think like, oh, I see some public space, it's mine. And I just put a chair there and I start reading a paper, for example. And I think also, of course, due to the climate, it's much easier to take, uh, to take up space outside, of course. Um, and compared to, of course, the, the picture that I showed in the beginning, of course, in, for example, the Netherlands, it's raining uh, very often. And of course, due to the climate, it's, it's, it's different. But I think it's also maybe a sense of perception that you can uh, take ownership of space uh, without having necessarily the, the, I don't know, somebody saying you need to. Um, on the contrary, of course, there's uh, lots of regulations, what you can do and what you can't do. But I think it's interesting to see how you can uh, use different regulations. Um, for example, in Hongdae, in, um, uh, in um, sorry, Seoul, it's a regulation that if you want to build another level, you have to open up to the public, uh, public um, sector, uh, sorry, the public space with the curb. 
I think that's super interesting to see that if you use these regulations and uh, maybe there's a bit more rules of, of course compared to what you can use in, in buildings and, and public space compared to uh, the Western uh, perspective. But if you need the different regulations, maybe it's also interesting to see how you can, as a government sometimes, can open up the public um, better for people. Um, but I think it's also very interesting to see that uh, there's a sense of community, sense of coming together. And in, in, for example, in temples, in front of temples, you have lots of spaces where people can come together. There's a, a bit of a less, um, yeah, sense of, of collectiveness in, in Western communities than compared to more Asian communities. So I think that the sense of community is a bit stronger and we should embrace that as well, of course, uh, instead of having a sort of a, um, yeah, a sense of, of feeling a, 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 yeah, not at, at home in a city or alone in a city. Um, yeah. I, I May I add to that a little bit? Sure, uh, sure. So I, I think uh, we really can learn, uh, one of the things we really can learn is the, the scale of the development, right? And uh, the, the, the size of the development as well. Um, and then how to combine that with uh, high quality public space. Um, so I would uh, challenge everybody to take a, a broader notion of what public space is, because it's not just the, the horizontal surface of the street. It's a three dimensional experience that also includes the facades of buildings and, and, and mostly, of course, the, the ground floor spaces. Those are the most, the parts most feeding to the quality of the public space. So I think there lies a, a large part of the, of the potential of co-creation in a, in a highly high density uh, urbanized uh, context. And I think in, to that regard, the Hongdae case is really brilliant because all the government has done is to use the pressure on that area to densify uh, and connect it with a, a rule for a better city at eye level. And they, they tap into the co-creation energy of all the individual building owners. And that area has transformed from, from a dead area into a vibrant area over the course of five years, just using the simple regulation. So I think it's a really a great case of, of co-creation that a, a lot of the densifying cities in the West can now also learn uh, from. And. Uh, Probably another big lesson is the climate lessons that we can take from cities like Singapore, who of course consistently have been working on uh, shifting from uh, a city with parks to a, a city in a park uh, over the past decades and uh, really resulting in, in a lower temperature uh, on average than uh, same cities in, at, uh, on the same, uh, the same uh, place on the, on, the, on the map of the earth. Um, so, and, and, and again, also, the, the uh, heating up summers are coming to the, to the West, so we need to learn from the, these consistent multi-year uh, strategies that cities like Singapore are using in the West as well. So it seems like we are also getting from your, from your point of view this interesting of regulations. So in urban design, we many times talk that regulations are restrictive. But if in Asia we start to use regulations with, with, a, with a wise take, with a positive take to enable, uh, instead of just uh, going back. So in Europe, of course, we were used for many years to not be able to do this and that. The public space was regulated, over-regulated in many cases. So people started to feel a bit uh, dissociated from public space. In Asia, people are a bit more natural, reading from, of course, my experience, but in this case, from your presentation. Uh, so I think that in, we shouldn't go back and do all the mistakes that we did in Europe but basically pick up on regulations that can enable that, uh, that behavior and that can make it productive in terms of, of generating better, better futures. So uh, it's very strange, but out of these two presentations, we are going to this idea of encouraging and enabling, uh, like public space as an enabler, which seems very, uh, very wise and that makes a lot of sense. Pablo, I will move now to you. So I was looking into your presentation and it's, it's a, a very interesting way of looking into these things. So how can we design uh, for disorder and in a way that you're uh, promoting disorder? Uh, so of course it's polemical. Uh, our uh, panelists are also already picking on you on this topic. And I'd like to ask you this question. What are the things that are not happening in the public space nowadays that can happen if you plan for 
uncertainty. So what are the things that if you don't do an effort will never happen by itself? Yeah, so I think one of the key things that we argue in the, in the book is that during the 20th century and the 21st century, the city has moved so much towards order uh, and everything is so controlled and so overdetermined that if we don't take any further action, the city tends to close itself but by the way the city has evolved. So in a way, intervention is necessary to provoke um, um, social interaction and unpredictable uses. And I think the, the example that I, that I proposed in, in Dealer Square is very clear in the sense that if you not, don't take particular actions that include um, and welcome uh, different minorities, uh, for example, in cities like London, that is kind of like a super diverse city, uh, certain minorities or uh, groups with uh, more risk of exclusion will be automatically excluded from, from the public space. So if you don't make that kind of efforts uh, in, with your design, with your uh, management of the space, uh, that won't happen. So that's, that's one uh, main thing. And then Another thing would be kind of like the, the, the continuous flexible use of the public space. So if, uh, unless you provide certain platform for the public space to keep changing, things what happen. And then a furthermore is the, is the social infrastructure that uh, cities today, due to the forms of life and the way capitalism has evolved, uh, has makes it is very individualistic. People are kind of like just minded about their businesses, going to work and then finishing certain things and, and, and do not live a collective life uh, anymore. Whereas some of the actions that, that we propose in the book on creating collective infrastructure, uh, collective ownership of certain things, collective management, they do create certain community, uh, like certain interaction, social interaction between uh, different people. So I think these are a few things that unless we design for it, uh, normally they won't happen because the way cities have evolved in the last few years. Yes, and I and think also in the Greater Bay, what, what you're mentioning just now that applies directly. So of course you're talking from London, I'm talking from Macau, uh, and we are, we are trying to apply this to the Greater Bay. Is, is the minorities in, in the Greater Bay, they are quite large. So in Macau, one third of the population are migrant workers. And in this moment, uh, it, the public space does not acknowledge them. The housing market does not acknowledge them. So basically, these are also opportunities to make, of course, to, to create proper spaces for these people, but also to improve the cities where we are with this energy that is there, but that is not being tapped to because the, basically the system doesn't, uh, doesn't welcome this participation. So I think that in the Greater Bay, this suggestion that you're making is something that is quite useful and both in Hong Kong and in Macau, uh, uh, this is, there's, a, there's a tremendous uh, opportunity uh, here in, in, because we have these this huge populations of migrant workers uh, that, uh, that basically uh, already occupy whenever little spaces they can, right? So there's a, a big energy. Also, other thing that I find very interesting is that we need to design for multiple uses. So if we don't create a, an opportunity for these things to happen, they will not happen or it will be difficult for them to happen. So sometimes it's not just enough to do nothing and to leave the space open for stuff. We need to provoke. We need to create an opportunity to, 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 so that several things uh, happen in the future. So I think that this is also uh, something that we can also quite apply. And also if we turn it into the regulations, the idea of not closing, of not going mon monofunctional, is also something that applies from your, uh, from your presentation, something that makes a lot of sense to this scenario. I'm reading yes. now my R. Yes, yes, Pablo. I just wanted to, because uh, I think, I think um, Isabella has directed kind of like a question for me before the things related to what you're just saying. Um, but I have to say that, I, that I, haven't been, I haven't been in Hong Kong, so most of the things that I know of Hong Kong and Macau are from, from my students. That, from supervising their dissertations, PhDs, and so on. Uh, I mean, I, I lived in Shanghai for a bit, and then I've actually uh, I'm, I'm supervising two PhDs with Matthew on 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 Shanghai. But I mean, one of the key things that from from work, I mean, for conversations with students and so on uh, about about these cities, 
uh, and, and how these kind of ideas apply there is one through the interaction between the the social infrastructure and the physical infrastructure. For example, Matthew and I have now one student that she's looking at a lot of the community initiatives that emerged during COVID um, in China in this in this case, uh, but and how in a way the different kind of relationships between volunteers and communities that emerge uh, in the area. And then another another thing that I think it's important is also the um, yeah, I mean, and, and that social infrastructure in a way how it takes the public space, the community spaces and so on. And then another part is the, which other students have looked at, is the the issue of the uh, the kind of like the daily life in public spaces by let's say, di diverse people uh, and how the public spaces are used and how the public spaces are transformed by people to create the certain situations. And also how the design of certain public spaces make more possibilities for third certain things to to happen and i think this is something probably how i would relate it to to cases like 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 in hong kong or macau i mean we which kind of spaces facilitate uh, i don't know the, the way people use public spaces um even informally um than they had years ago another student that did um uh, also how, I don't know, how the, I think the, the Filipino workers used kind of like the transition spaces in in, in, in public transport in, in Hong Kong and things like that. So I don't know, that it's also interesting to look at, at how different diverse communities use the spaces and how they make it their own. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that when you talk about regulations, usually we think about restricting behaviors, uh, but there's also the other opportunity of enabling behaviors. And it's already quite rich with so many restrictions, what's happening in some of these places. Uh, but I think that that, that, that possibility to create uh, public spaces that enable uh, more uses, it's, it's something that is needed uh, in, in the Greater Bay Area. Because this idea of gated communities, this idea of restricted public spaces, even public spaces, so we have public spaces that are closed uh, uh, in Macau. Uh, so I think that this is really needed in the Greater Bay because basically we don't need to make all the mistakes. We can already start from from a good platform of enabling of this idea of the public space as an enabler of, of different behaviors and as welcoming to different behaviors. Thank you, Pablo. So I'll, I'll jump now to the last, to my hierarchy for a last question. So uh, you are looking into this informal and formal and you are discovering new possibilities. So what, what are, the, the, of course, the preliminary findings that you have of, uh, of stuff that people are not yet doing and what are the opportunities that you see that, that could basically transform in a positive way uh, urban design? Uh, well, I think, you know, as I mentioned in the presentation, I really, um, you know, being an academic uh, researcher for many years, we, very rare. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking for myself. You know, I've very rarely has uh, opportunities or uh, come in a in a way that I uh, kind of walk out of my way to something that I'm stumbling and I have not discovered. But this really uh, uh, particular um, incident taught me that, as again, as all the presenters were uh, discussing in the presentations cities are really much more complex and much more nuanced than you know sometimes we as researchers would like them to be or maybe we want to take them as you know one step at a time but i think as again all the presentations we're talking about in disorder and making order and or turning order into disorder and vice versa or using public space as enablers all of these things, I, I think, you know, when you try to put them under the uh, theoretical umbrella of, of urban design, then you would uh, sometimes, you know, as I mentioned in my subtitle, uh, something like a strange bedfellows, because it really takes a long time to digest them, to really try to understand them theoretically and how they're connected. And honestly, I'm not even there yet. I don't even think that I fully understand what I've done so far because I need to sit on it. I need to work on it a little bit more. 
I need to try to make connections. And I think all these presentations with all the layers of complexities, you know, using uh, uh, assemblage as a theory and all that, that kind of stuff, I think it helps us to, you know, go slower and maybe try to think through them more. And my next step would obviously would be to, you know, kind of play around with these and, and try to, uh, as all the presentations, you all had cases studies, and I would like to really do that at this level, you know, go and discover biomimicry and biophilic uh, with the, uh, the, the huge scales. I've seen a few of them probably in the in Asian countries, like in, in, in China. I know that they exist a lot more in China, probably, and maybe in Europe. Uh, but uh, they're kind of evolving as we speak as new um, technologies allow uh, architects and, and builders and governments even to try to I know Mazdar City in Dubai, for example, is unfolding. That's also one probably uh, a biomimic or a biophilic um, example of that. And then we have DIY. We have all these you know, fantastic projects that work as enablers. So I'm trying to kind of digest one step at a time. And for me, the next step would be to go slow by, slowly and try to see connections that uh, are not clear to me at this point in time, but I hope uh, in the future I can have more, um, you know, interesting and promising things to talk about. Thank you. So what about the floor? Do we have questions for our panelists from the floor? I'd just like to say something that about this, um, I think the differences between, because Matthew, discuss about this private and public, right? There's some, some, some now in our cities, especially in Hong Kong, these two, uh, uh, let's say the boundary between these two, um, you know, private and public sometimes overlaps and creating some hybridities, no? Uh, even when we, I mean, in, in, the, in the paper, uh, I wrote with Melody, no, about the POPs. It's like the privately, privately owned public space. So there's like uh, spaces which, um, let's say, the ownership somehow is not important, right? So you pass from the public to private. I think that the people are not aware, right? In the case of UCLA, UCL, when they work and they are in, uh, in, in some space, sometimes the ownership is not... Uh, that relevant uh, as long as they became place for the community. But I think there's somehow a discussion of how the public space or the private space is uh, understood in the Asian uh, parts of the world, right? Because sometimes probably this um, distinction that we have clear in mind as a, for example, European, is not that clear in, in the mindset. I mean, the space we live uh, in this part of the world. So I, think I, I understood and I learned that it's not that obvious when you talk about public space, when you talk about private space. Uh, and I think this is a, an important point to, 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 to discuss, also to raise, because I think this is, can change even the way how we can analyze, uh, how we can study uh, those spaces. Yeah, I think this is just not probably a, a question, but just like a, a reflection about how sometimes in the Asian country we absorb Western, uh, for example, concept. But then I think it's the moment to understand the reality here and maybe bring this, what happens here in the other part of the world. I think this would be an interesting uh, spin, no? I think in, the, in this moment, in this particular moment. I think in Hong Kong, there's even lots of opportunity for programming of, of private spaces for the public. And I think there's, there's a sort of a big contrast of, of course, private space. Uh, but I think, for example, in Quarry Bay by Swire, it's, it's they, they really think of a whole program throughout the day for different kinds of target groups. And I think that's, of course, different if you just have public space where you just allow people to do something and hopefully there is a, a community that does programming. But I think in the end, private space, um, like lots of spaces in Hong Kong, can be interestingly programmed by these organizations who do understand that it's important to, to do placemaking and to do something different than only like commercial programming, for example. Do we have more questions from the floor? 
I, I think, think we have mm-hmm. a, a question of Peter. Yeah, Peter would like yeah. to ask something. Peter. Peter would like to. Hello, hello, Nuno. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your your talks. I just have um, a question. I, I've been looking for about um, three or four years at Hong Kong and the residual spaces of Hong Kong. And I think one of the things I've found is that some of the public areas are in a way over-designed. And what happens with this over-design is that people find a condition which is the residual. And the residual actually is not programmed for anything, but it becomes an incredibly fertile place for all these things that cannot happen. So I was thinking of Matthew's posters that what cannot happen in actual fact is a, is a list of things that do happen in these residual spaces. And I think the fact that they're not planned, that they happen by accident, that they happen for a certain period of time offers an incredible potential because those other spaces are designed in such a way. And I'm wondering if any of the panelists have been thinking of this relationship between the planned and the planned, especially in relation to the residual condition. Thank you. Peter, if I could come in. I think, I think you're exactly right that very often those spaces, those leftover spaces are the, some of the most interesting spaces in cities because they don't seem to belong to anybody and therefore they're, they're, the management is often quite light and, 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 and therefore things happen. Um, and yeah, they, they, they can be fascinating. But, but I think there's also, there's also an element that, you know, cities go through, go through time. And, you know, we, we often criticize the sort of shiny new blocks that go up, that are heavily managed and so forth. But in time, those will become old and, 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 and new places will be built. And, and those will become places that, you know, adapt and change and, and new ownerships and, and, and less heavily managed. And, and so the sort of places that, uh, you know, some of the housing estates, for example, that Pablo has been looking at in his research built in the 19, 50s and 60s and, and, and 70s and so forth. Um, when they were shiny and new, probably there were all sorts of restrictions on what you could and couldn't do. But now it's, it's you know, there's more freedom and so forth. And, and I think we need to see cities in that light that, you know, when, when, when places are built anew, then, yeah, obviously they, 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 they tend to be quite heavily managed, but that doesn't necessarily mean they always will be like that. Um, so there's all sorts of subtleties in this and those residual spaces you talked about are some of those uh, very interesting subtleties, I think. <laughs> I think there's a couple of really great cases, so in, for instance, in Yangon and Kuala Lumpur, where the, the laneways uh, have been totally uh, neglected for a long time and now being opened back up uh, in co-creation with the local stakeholders to, to add, actually add to the volume of uh, uh, publicly accessible space in uh, cities that are very uh, heavily uh, uh, dominated by, by car traffic nowadays. So I think there lies a huge opportunity in finding these residual spaces and uh, reconquering them for, for public use. Peter, I also have a, an observation for your case. I think that when we go to Hong Kong, we have lots of those leftover spaces and some are really uh, appropriated and uh, occupied with several uh, temporary uses that are quite quite different and quite, quite rich and quite diverse. In Macau, uh, not so much. So many of our leftover spaces are managed, are designed by the local municipality uh, and not much interesting stuff is happening. It's like creating, putting functions, uh, one single function under uh, a viaduct. And then it's, so, so now that, that you're asking that question, I'm trying to see the opportunities in Macau. And of course, the nature of the city is a bit different, uh, but we, uh, we have a bit of over management uh, that is not that inspiring, that is not that enabling. But, but I think, Nuno, when, when, when one takes the, the, the question to places like Wanjo and the, the, the amount of urban infrastructure that is there is kind of exponential. Mm-hmm. And just the possibilities that are there and the possibilities that could arise because we, we can't imagine them. I, 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 I just, I'm just wondering if, if this question that we're asking of making place compared to place making is, is a subtle difference. But in actual fact, there, there could be some tension between these two 
philosophies in a way. And I think that for the Greater Bay, for the Greater Bay, in terms of the nature of the cities, uh, there are many, many opportunities on this typology that you're mentioning. So I think that for the development of the Greater Bay, that is a really interesting area for to to, to develop uh, new typologies, new opportunities uh, that that can can really help to shape to shape a different space in the Greater Bay. So Jata, you're asking a question. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on uh, Peter's question. Uh, actually, there's a public housing estate in Hong Kong where uh, you have an older development with public space, which was not over designed. It's really just flexible space. And uh, the other area is the newly designed, over designed space, landscape, award winning and everything. And if you go and see there, the place that is really used is the old open space, not the new one, which is over designed. So that's like, you know, real contrast and it's like amazing that what people really want, I think is not too much of over designing, but freedom to do what they want to do. And maybe that is one thing that can be like a takeaway from also what we are hearing here. And also I had a question for Pablo earlier, is if you had to, if you were given a position or something to actually work in JBA, or make sure that placemaking is actually happening the way you were thinking, like, you know, designing disorder, what would be your first one or two things that you would do? Well, the first thing I would do is kind of like get to know uh, the cities because I, I, I don't know them. So I think that one key thing is to get to know the cities that you work in. Uh, so that so that would be kind of like a, a very first step. As I said, uh, m most of the only things I know of of uh, of the Greater Bay Area are are through my through my students. So only a, a very remote uh, knowledge. Uh, but um, but I think that one of the I mean, if I take some of the lessons that that come from my research, is to uh, look uh, for uh, and, and probably that's linking to the issue of around networks and municipalism is looking which are the networks. So if, if I was, let's say, the municipalist uh, officer, let's say, uh, looking which are the networks, looking which are those um, groups that are struggling to find a space to develop their activities and what do they need and and then based on that, based on the, on the ways they like using the public spaces, the community facilities, and so on, see how their activities can be enhanced and what new things can be planned. That would be probably my, my, my first thing to do. Thank you. Can I add something about the, the last uh, point that we discussed about this sort of uh, residual areas? I think that there's a case in Hong Kong, which is the the public cargo working area, which is like a, a, a pier, uh, which is um, now is closed, but I think it was voted one, one of the best public spaces in Hong Kong. Actually, uh, there's a, officially, the people cannot go there because there's a, it's, it's a working area. So there's no possibility to go there. But then in somehow the people after the working hours around, let's say five o'clock, the people just uh, arrive in the pier and actually there's no program there. So there's no railing to protect the people to falling down in the water. There's no playground. There's, there's nothing basically, just, just a bunch of uh, containers, uh, platform, wood uh, stuff, people fishing. And I think the, the, the real program is the people who, who do activities there. So basically there's people dancing at some hour, there's people walking dogs, there's running. I think it's totally amazing because it's unre unregulated. And, and I think it's one of the most successful spaces that we have. I mean, we had because now it's closed. But I think there's a contrast between somehow the formal public space and the informal areas. I think I will discuss tomorrow more in my presentation about this contrast. But anyway, there's something that we should analyze. And also this idea of overlapping private public. I think that the things that are coming together, it's so interesting in this unregulated space when the, 
the most uh, relevant, uh, let's say, actors are the people who are giving sense to that space. So I think this is something that uh, it's, it's quite relevant. It, it's quite weird in a super regulated space that we have in Hong Kong, no? May I suggest to add uh, another element of the discussion uh, further on as well, uh, when it comes to the informal informality of the places? Because I think one of the great observations, of course, in, in uh, cities in Asia are the, are the markets, right? The, the mm -hmm. great experience. And they have a high degree of uh, informality, of co-creation, of uh, and, uh, social values, uh, affordability of, uh, of food. Uh, so th there's a very layered way. And, and also it's heritage, I think, right? So I think um, if we want to talk about place in an Asian context, we, we, we cannot talk about place and informality without addressing the, the, the value of, uh, of markets. And, uh, I think there could be more attention to the to the value of markets from a from a from probably from a policy stand of view as well. Uh, they're not just new nu nuisances in the in the street. They they have great social values and they have great uh, historic values as well. I think also to add the indoor and outdoor. It is not necessarily everything is outdoor because there's it could be like a transition space too, and that's something to think about as well. Macau is an interesting case in terms of the in terms of the markets and the hawkers, because it used during many years uh, Portugal's law, but in Portugal there are little hawkers, and in Macau there were thousands of hawkers. So there's a way to organize. So hawkers can in Macau they can do their business, their trades between that number of the street and the other number of the street. So it's not prescriptive. It's not saying exactly where you fit, and it gives that flexibility that is somehow regulated but somehow gives the freedom for them to find a place and to adjust to, to the city. So I, I, I think, and like you're saying, I think that is something that has to do with the vitality of streets in Asia that still has a lot to do with, with commerce, with informal uh, trading in some cases. In Macau, it's not informal, this is formal. Uh, that, again, it's, it's, it's a, quali a quality that in many of these over-designed spaces, is, it tries to be uh, limited. And I think that that also has to do with the, with the usage, as Francesco, Francesco was saying before. So many of these spaces that we like, we can eat something there, we can, we can do different things, we can, and, and that diversity, it's, it's, it's quite, quite the richness of that place. So I, I think that this is something that we really need to, to nurture and to, and to work with in Asia, because it's an asset that, um, it's a great asset. And I've seen so many streets where it would have otherwise been blank walls and a hawker only basically needs a 60 centimeter depth place to, mm. to write on the wall and, and the street becomes active. So, or it's only one meter 50 uh, wide and, and, and you can have a lot of uh, stalls next to each other. So there's a lot of creativity in using the space uh, and, and, and creating a, a great human scale on the street at the same time. Exactly. I, I'm doing a, a public project at this moment, and one of the interventions is to to note places where hawkers can be, because otherwise, uh, okay. So how can we create this opportunity? So it's basically highlighting places where hawkers can be, and the municipality gets that plan and sees, okay, what no no you have places where hawkers yes oh okay this fits with our rules so they kind of accept so it's basically creating this opportunity. So do we have more questions? I think we are running a bit late. Francesco, you are the boss here. Do we have more interventions uh, or final comments from our panelists? No, I think I just really enjoyed this evening uh, panel. And that really, I would like to thank um, all of you. So Matthew, Sienna, Hans, Pablo, Mahir, Nuno, of course, and Isabella and Sujat. I think it was that a great um, uh, discussion. I think the, the, the range of the topic discussed is, is huge. So we went to, you know, different areas. And I think I, I really like also the exploration, the, the, theoretical, theoretical exploration of uh, Professor Arefi, which is just inspired me because there's always in this field fields of exploration. I think uh, there's always, uh, uh, you know, a, a good moment to, to stop and reflect about what we are uh, 
uh, experiencing and i think even uh in this time which is so challenging about you know uh, in our life i think there's a time to to stop and reflect and and, and maybe even um uh give a new uh you know uh, lens to look at urban phenomena so especially in this great bay area which will be an amount incredible amount of uh, of project coming, so the attention will be here. And I think in some presentation in the afternoon, we saw project designed like 10 years ago or 15 years ago that have been redesigned because there are, you know, um, even in recent times, they've not paid so much attention about the role of the empty space, you know, on the space in between buildings, which are extremely important for developing the public life of our city. Sometimes it's not only the building, but it's the interface mm -hmm. between open spaces and building. No, I think always I have this in mind, the only plan, right? When you have the figure ground of building and open space all together. And I think this was the first time that the only opened up the maps to the inside space of the church. So which is um, somehow where the collectivity can own those spaces. So I think at that time, I think we are developing even new concepts. I think, but that plan, with not only plan, show the symbiotic relation between open space and buildings. I think still nowadays is quite important, but we are stressing the concept of how we live in this sort of uh, white space, which are, let's say, open space or public space. So I think this is a reflection with it's very important. And uh, I probably, yes, just uh, just last few words. Just thank you guys to be here. Thank you, Francesco, for this opportunity. I also think that something that is common, so we had a, a panel that was very rich, very diverse, that had very unique topics coming from different perspectives. But I think that going through these different presentations, there is something that is kind of a consensus, if I may, try to, to, to highlight this consensus, which is this ena enabling diverse uses on public space. So I think that this was, you're saying it in a different way on each presentation, but I think that this is one of the richness that we, we, we should basically encourage. And the Greater Bay Area that now has this name, that is a recent name, uh, it's this new world that needs a new ambition. So I think that because it's this network starts to, to, to generate knowledge and attention on the Greater Bay. So I think that for this new world that we are creating here in the Greater Bay, we need to have a new ambition. And this ambition shouldn't just be about GDP, but should be about urban qualities that uh, are not yet being consistently uh, promoted and generated. So thanks a lot to our panelists. Thanks a lot, Francesco, to create this opportunity. And I think that this takeaway of uh, enabling diverse use is, is something that, uh, so how can we do that? How can we improve these possibilities? I think it is an important takeaway from this, uh, from this session. So yeah. thanks a lot.